now from the Gospel of Matthew, continuing with the fifth chapter, this week beginning with the 13th verse. Listen now to these words from Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. These are the words of the Lord. Let us pray. O great and holy God, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts and meditations resting on each one of our hearts in these moments, may they all be acceptable to you. You who are today and forever our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today, we return to the Mount of Beatitudes, a hillside in northern Israel that is close to Capernaum and adjacent to the Sea of Galilee. It is on this hill where long-standing tradition has Jesus preaching his first and best-known sermon to a crowd of people. Last Sunday we heard Jesus begin his Sermon on the Mount with the beautiful pronouncement of eight blessings which we know as the Beatitudes. I'd like to think some of you found yourself returning and even lingering on that hillside throughout this past week as you prayerfully considered the Beatitudes and how you, your being blessed by God translates into you being a blessing to others. I admit, I was very excited last week when I did not see last week's pink inserts in the recycling bin and the garbage cans following worship. So thank you. Thank you for taking it home and allowing me the feel-good opportunity of imagining you were prayerfully considering what was on that insert at least once over this past week. If you were not here last Sunday and are curious about that pink insert, well, you are in luck. There are a few of them in both the narthex and the lobby area, so feel free to grab one after worship and take it with you. It's probably the only pink little piece of paper you'll see out there. This past week, as I continued to reflect on Jesus' opening verses of the Sermon on the Mount, and then as I spent time with today's verses that I read just a short while ago, something came to my mind. It's something that most of us would agree is very important to us. Safety. Safety is a common concern. We want to feel safe. Safe in our homes, at school, at work, at stores, restaurants, dance halls, and at church. We spend money on security systems. We read about and attend training seminars that inform and train us on best safety practices. Schools have increased their safety practices and have expanded long-standing fire and tornado drills to include active <coughs> drills. Whether we live 
in the city or in a town, in the United States or in another country. Feeling and being safe is certainly a common human desire of ours. But Jesus does not talk about safety. It is not on his list of things to seriously consider or worry about. Do you remember the words Jesus ended with as he concluded his pronouncement of blessing last week? Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. No matter what your exact definition of safety is, this blessing upon the faithful does not sound safe at all, does it? A little later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Jesus told his disciples not to worry about safety and other things that most people, most of us, worry about but to instead focus on things such as repentance, baptism, grace, loving God and mother, <clears throat> justice, generosity, and being about the work of making disciples. There is nothing about safety on Jesus' list of important issues. <clears throat> if anything, Jesus was a risk-taking kind of leader. He told his followers to Get on out there to go and do, to go and be. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He doesn't say, do you want to be salt or do you want to be light? Jesus doesn't say, get salty. He doesn't say, light up. He says, as Almost a matter of fact, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. In other words, you already are salt and light. And of course, you might be wondering, when did that happen? When did I become salt? When did I become light? I'm just me, just trying to do my best, trying to live a good life. I'm watching out for me and my family, trying not to get trampled underfoot and taken advantage of by others. Okay, I might be a little bit of salt and light within my, within my house and family, among friends. But the world? And yet according to Jesus, this reality of who we are is not a choice that we have. I don't mean we are forced into something against our will. But what I mean, and what I think Jesus meant, was that we as individual followers, and as the church, are his representatives. Whether we consciously claim that role or not. People, neighbors, friends, strangers, will look at us and think, oh, so that's what it looks like. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it looks like to belong to a church. We don't get to pick and choose only certain times and places to be a Christian. Because the expectation is that we are always and everywhere a Christian. You are the salt of the earth. Nowadays, salt is a common, inexpensive item. We all have it in our cupboard at home. However, in the ancient world, salt was rare. It was expensive. It was both a highly valued item and a taxable item. Roman soldiers were paid in part with salt. For those who gathered on a hillside in Galilee 2,000 years ago, to hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, salt was valuable and associated with qualities, qualities like purity, preservation, Flavor. The Romans talked about salt as being the purest of all things because it came from the sun and from the sea. The Greeks considered it an item of divine origin.
salt was the most common of all preservatives in ancient days. Before refrigeration, no ingredient preserved food better than salt. As a preservative, it was an invaluable item that aided in the survival of numerous cultures. And perhaps the most obvious quality of salt for us today, but also true for those in Jesus' day, was its flavor, its flavor-enhancing quality. Now, over the years, I have visited individuals with health issues who were told by their doctor to give up salt. Perhaps some of you are among them. From those who truly enjoyed the plentiful usage of salt as a seasoning, it was hard to give up. I have often heard them say something like, food no longer tastes good. In fact, just this past week, I was visiting Bark Portwich at Menorah Park Rehab, and, and I was there when her dinner arrived. The food, which was supposed to be warm, was cold, and it did not look particularly appetizing. I asked Barb about the food as I helped her get it organized so she could easily eat. She agreed that it wasn't very good. And then right away she started lamenting about the fact that she was not allowed any salt. For some, food without salt is drab, it's tasteless. When Jesus said that we as followers are salt, he was saying that because of God's living presence within us, we have what is needed to preserve and make life better, better for others. In Jesus' day, another practice was, to, was for farmers who could afford it to salt their fields to improve the mix of minerals and so help crops grow. The word translated as earth in our passage today is literally ground or dirt. You are the salt of the ground, the salt of the dirt. It may not be a particularly attractive and fun job. After all, it's dirty, and it may involve people walking on us. And yet, by being salt, we help others grow and be better. You are the light of the world, said Jesus. No one lights a lamp for the purpose of hiding it. Admit it, you are thinking about that song, aren't you? I know I am. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Well, if you weren't thinking about it, you are now, right? <laughs> Jesus says, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You see, the thing is about light is that it doesn't exist for its own sake. It isn't about getting people to look at it and admire it, the light. Whenever we try to become the focus of attention, try to take center stage, we aren't actually being the light we are called to be. The light is there to help people find their way. It's about shining on the path, about revealing the hazards along the way. It's about getting where we and others need to be, where God wants us to be. This being salt, this being light, it's a risky business. After all, it's about loud and, and a noisy world. It is loud and noisy out there, isn't it? And, and a lot of times we would prefer to, to be safer, just keeping our heads down, our salt perhaps stored in a cellar, or our light hidden within the walls of our homes. But we can't, says Jesus, because a city built on a hill cannot be hid. Those words are a reminder that we are exposed. We are Jesus' disciples and representatives of the faith, whether we want to be or not. So we might as well be good ones. We are the manifestation 
about Christ in the world today, whether we claim to be or not. So why not claim it? Why not live as though Christ were alive in us? Why not love as Christ loves us? Why not forgive as Christ forgives us? Why not live lives characterized by kindness and grace and generosity? That is what Jesus is saying here. You are the salt of the earth. So help things grow and thrive. You are the light of the world, so, so help others find their way. Yes, we likely have plenty of opinions about how the world ought to be, but how we express those opinions matters when one is salt and one is light. So, let's serve, help, mentor, encourage, lead, and set the example. Let's be who and what we are, signs of Christ's presence in the world today. Consider for a moment those who have helped you, those who have helped you most over the years. Consider those who taught you about Jesus and showed you by their example what it is to live a life of faith. Who walked with you through a difficult time? Surely you are thankful for those who were salt and light to you. So how are you being salt and light to others? Well, Jesus says, get out there, out there in the world, the noisy, wonderful, scary, glorious world, and let the flavor of your life enhance the lives of others. Let the light of your life shine, the blessing of God's saving and transforming presence. Here are some of the pictures of this community, this community of faith, being salt and light. These pictures are glimpses of God's kingdom. Do you see it? Do you see it? We are blessed by the relationships we share as we fellowship and work together. And others are also blessed. Remember that pink insert I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon? On it was written the statement, you are blessed to be a blessing. In other words, you are the salt that adds the flavor of God's goodness to everything and helps others grow well. So be that salt. You are the light that helps others see and know God. So let your light shine. And now at this time, as we prepare as the community of faith to enter into a time of Holy Communion, I invite you to come. As we eat, as we drink together, Jesus invites us, each one of us, to know his gracious, saving presence, and to accept the blessing and challenge of God's kingdom life. So let us prepare ourselves as we join our voices, as together we confess.